down the hammer and pick up the pencil. You're about to listen to the Savvy Radio Show. Learn from real life real estate investors, experience revealed with the Savvy Landlord as your host. What's going on, Savvy Investors? This is your friend Steve Van Camber, the Savvy Landlord, hitting it down, getting to the part four of the questions you should ask a property manager if you're going to hire them. Yep, you should probably hire a property manager. Hands off is the way to roll. You might have an in-house property manager or you outsource this job. And if you're a property manager, maybe there's some notes that you can take down. But hopefully these are these four part hiring a property manager has helped you. I appreciate all the mad feedback and support uh, for this subject. If there's another subject out there, I'll let your boy know and I'll break it off. All right. So I went through one through five on part three. Now I'm going to finish it up six through 10 and call it a day, put it down unless you send me some good questions and I will rock it for you. Number six, do you select tenants and how do you approve them? Ooh, you should be hands off property managers. I mean, uh, savvy investors, property managers, that's their job. That's what they're paying them for. But you should ask them, how do they select the tenants? What's the approval process? And do you have to sign off on it? And what you savvy investor, what is your expectations? You need to put those in writing. Like here's some tips for you. One, you know, I would always have them send me a lease for me to approve. They cannot prove a tenant unless I do it. Now, here's the thing. Many times we have in Oklahoma City, we have great resources that you can pull up uh, on demand court records. And many times that the leasing agent's too busy working tons of other clients or tons of applications. And, you know, they're not giving me the service and no disrespect. I get it. You know, they're only making 10% on the deal. And they may be making a percentage or a half or full month's rent or something to incentivize them to get this slam this tenant in there and they overlook stuff. And so I have caught many property managers in my little lifetime, uh, you know, they, I found eviction records on somebody and they were going to rent them to them. This is, this is, I want to give you some kahunas here. This is your property. Yep. Savvy investor. This is your property. Yep, savvy investor. I said it twice, one more time. It is your call. You should have the property manager email you a copy of their application in their processing in their due diligence that they did. And then what I do is I do a quick Google search myself or a Facebook search or a Twitter search or whatever I can find. And if you listen to my podcast on Nerdwack Wednesdays and tomorrow I'm going to break off another freaky information skip tracing. Oh, do you tune in tomorrow? Because it's like, oh, no, how, how where are the? And this company is from South Africa. And, you, you know, if you're a third world country, have you been hustled before, uh, you know, over the phone on Craigslist or you hear people pay money to these countries while they're making uh, skip trace websites as well. And they're very amazing for us as landlords. Anyway, so, you know, you should always look at the application and just see if you see anything wrong with it. Is it accurate? Is the income correct? And you get, you got to give it up for property managers. They're busy and they hire a uh, different type of people to work for them. And they, you know, things fall through the cracks. It's your job at the end of the day And I know you're like, Van Kallenberg, aren't you supposed to be hands off? I know, I know. Look, man, it takes 10 minutes. They're doing all the hard work, that property manager. They're advertising, they're marketing, they're gobbling up all these applications. They're kind of vetting them out as much as possible. And then then they're narrowing them down, hopefully to a few, and then they're sending them to you. Now, here's a couple cool things. At least you can see what's out there and how often are you getting them. And so you don't, you're not just in the cloud. And so this is another question you should ask. How do you select tenants and who does the approving? And am I involved in that? And make sure you set your expectations and make sure that we're clear on those expectations between you, savvy investor and the property manager. I know this is another obvious question, but 
how do you collect the, the rent from the tenants? Now, if they have sophisticated software, as I mentioned in the last episode, how are you collecting them? Are they allowed to pay in cash? Do they do checks? How does that work? Now, right out the gate, I'm going to tell you right now, do not accept cash, period. Cash tends to dwindle, be misplaced, confused, whatever, pocketed. But who collects the rent? Do they offer direct deposit? And how and how long does it take to get into your account? That's something that you need to be questioned on. And then if it is like direct deposit or credit card, do you who charges that fee and who's that charged to? And so you need to, of course, a lot. I mean, I'm not saying a lot of my tenants, but, you know, it seems like as the years click on more and more people are doing online, you know, EFTs, paying through credit cards, so on and so forth. Now, we do a conveniency fee for that service and we charge them the minimum, whatever it costs us, we pass that on to them. You can't charge them a fee. You can charge them a, can, you can't charge them a credit card processing fee. I'm not sure what the legal thing is, but you can charge them that a fee for that type of service. Now, do they have an office? How is the check written? What is it written to them? Obviously it is, but what's the process for, if the check bounces, who loses, uh, what's the fees. You just need a general idea of what's going on with the rent, what's happening, and how long it's going to take to get to you, which is the most important thing. And these are questions that you should try to write down. And remember, I'm throwing these in there. All right. Now, we're about maintenance. Now, maintenance is your only deal killer in real estate investing. So, Hopefully you are in real estate investing and this is your rental property and you're at 25 units and you're like, man, I can retire, blah, blah, blah. So maintenance will eat up your profit. So if you think you need to retire on 25, double that deal. If you think you need to you know, retire on 50, double that deal. If you think you need to retire on 100, that's what I thought, double that deal because maintenance will eat you up. And this is a rule of thumb that I, this last two years, I have been trying to be completely hands off as much as possible and expenses go through the roof because someone else is spending your money. Keep that in mind. Now, the goal of real estate investing is freedom. Now, freedom has a price. It's not free. (laughs) Freedom, free, yeah, whatever. Anyway, but the thing is, you know, this has happened to me and who pays for this? A maintenance guy got the wrong paint and he painted a house the wrong color. Who pays for that? Now, if I was running the show down there at the pro, you know, the property manager, I'd beat that dude up. Now, physically, I was like, you're paying for the paint, but there's some clerical issues, some miscommunication between the property manager and the maintenance guy. And ultimately, who suffers? The owner, me. So I lost, you know, $50, $60 on paint times 100. That's six G's. Do the math, okay? So scale doesn't mean you're actually richer. It just means you have more issues in my mind. Now, you got to find out how they handle maintenance. Some companies, you may never heard this before. Some people have a maintenance reserve, like they have a thousand dollars in their bank account. And you know how I operate with my property manager, they can pretty much spend $500 without calling me. Then that after if the repair is five hundred dollars or more, now that's the first level of property management. The second level of pro. So, in my organization, I have a general manager that. So I'm CEO of something. Under me is a general manager of the whole operation, and then under her is a property manager. Now the general manager she hires and fires everybody. She handles all that type of jazz for me. I basically communicate with the general manager. Now, the the person that answers the phone that's, you know, running around doing what they do, they can spend usually up to three. I, I try to say 300, but I have a threshold in my mind of $500. Anything over $300, I get a little juicy on 500. I'm like, whoa, whoa, you cannot spend under 500 over 500. Now, if the repair is $500 or more, They have to go to phase two, which is a general manager and get approval there. That manager, that general manager has up to a thousand dollars of spending without calling me. 
And so I do this because I don't want people calling me, hey, we need more blinds over here at blank, blank Elm Street. It's going to be $300. You know, if it needs blinds, put the blinds in. Now, before, you know, I trained all my property managers. They know that we're thrifty, that when we buy and pay for these things, they cost us money. We're losing money. How can we bless more people? How can we give pay raises? So it's your job to save as much as possible and communicate that to them. But that national, you know, as you grow in size and you become distant from this company and that's your goal, hands off, you, you need to have reserves in place. And what are those numbers? And so first of all, when you're communicating with this property manager, what is their process? How does it work? And is it transparent? Meaning, can I see the bills? Now, you're going to find out real fast what this property manager's like when you say, can I see the bills? And you, some people, they, they mark them up. And that's my next question. But you need to know, do they have reserves or can I handle the maintenance myself? Now, when I took over these properties and I've had all these problems with this property manager, I was very clear day one when I took these mugs over. I own property myself. I handle all my own property management myself. And wh- what does that entail? Well, if if a plumbing call goes down, and if they were a legitimate property manager, I would usually let them handle it. But we were having problems with this property manager since day one. There was a lot of sketchiness going on. And so I was like, well, the first thing you want to do, and, and I figured all this out because this is how I got these properties from this poor uh, investor is that this property manager was taking them to the bank through repairs. I mean, they were bleeding this investor $1,500 a month to $1,100 a month on an average for years on these fake repairs. And so if you really you know, need to hunker down or in the beginning, you might want to take the maintenance side of things. Now, Again, I know this is why you're hiring a property manager. I get it. Now, in the beginning, you know, set the parameters, but find out what their system is and how does it work with those people. Now, if you really want to scale and you really want to go, you, you need to check on the invoices that they sent. Like, say they, they a tenant moved out and the, and the property manager charged the tenant a fee of $300 to do a repair in a, on a door. Let's say, say they ripped out the, the, the hinge or, uh, you know, make up something. And, you know, you, you see the invoice go through, you don't pay for it. It comes out of their deposit. Great. And, you know, in the beginning, you should probably go check that repair just, just to be kosher and say, and you, again, pro savvy investor, you're in control. This is your asset. You, in the beginning, and I'm, I'm thinking throughout, you should do some checks and balances. Even to myself personally, I, you know, I'm trying to stay focused on my goals right now. But, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit or something came up to me the other day. I'm like, Stephen, you need to check on some of these properties. These rehabs or repairs or whatever you want to call them, they're going down right now. You need to go look at them, see the quality of work, see what this property manager is hiring where are these contractors coming from? Are they licensed? Are they, are they insured? You know, all these key things that you need to be aware of. And this property manager is representing you. Now, if anything ever goes down, guess what's up? You are responsible. I'm not trying to scare you. A lot of you just cried and peed your pants, but you are required to maintain the property and you need to find out how it's being handled. Number nine. Do they mark up maintenance and repairs? Now, if we get this up on the table first, then it's pretty cool. Now, you know, your property man just depends on what scale they are, okay? Their goal should not make money on repairs. Now, some property managers, and I'm not dogging them, and it's not right or wrong, some of them charge a fee for picking up the phone and orchestrating the transaction. Some property managers charge 10% and I've seen 25%. Is that right or wrong? You know, I, I don't, I don't know. Okay. And this would be a great debate in that we you know in July 19th, we got this going down Oklahoma city, but hopefully I remember this, but 
you know, I was offered once when I was doing a lot of rehabs and a guy asked me, Hey man, what would you charge to manage my job? And I was like, uh, I don't know. And he offered to pay me a thousand bucks to help him. And I saved him a ton of money, uh, hiring the right contractor and not getting bamboozled. Probably that thousand, he was a smart, savvy investor. He paid me a G and it probably saved him thousands of headache, hours of headache. I mean, the guy had a full-time job. He was trying to rehab this house and he couldn't get it done. And of course I'm available. And so I drove over there a couple of times a week and just made sure the job went well and reported to him and it was well worth it to him. And, you know, I never thought of that, but that's what a property manager should be doing for you as well. And so I don't really necessarily get upset that they charge a fee. Um, but this is one thing that I think is very savvy. You know, an average plumbing call, you know, is 125 bucks, let's say. And this property manager is savvy and he's worked at a deal with a plumber and say, look, I'm going to provide you tons of service and I'm going to give you tons of calls. You'll be my first guy I'm going to call. But for that exchange, for that type of flow of business, I need a discount. And that guy says, okay, I'll, I'll do drain outs for you for $85. Okay. This, I'm making this up guys. So just bear with me. And that property manager tax on a fee for that transaction. So let's just say tax on 15 bucks. I don't know what that's 10%, 20%. Well, yeah, you know, 10% would be 20% almost. Okay. Now that's a hundred bucks that cost you. Now in reality, it was $125. You actually saved 25%. I don't know. I think you need to have an open communication. Of, I would say transparency uh, with that property manager and just need to know on the going on the front end on the repairs a lot of property managers some of them don't have uh, a lot of them when i say some of them i'm I'm, bear with me here it's late but some of them have side management i mean handyman companies some of them employ handyman uh full-time you need some of them just straight outsource so you need to know that is any of those good or bad or ugly you know, I got some interviews of some real estate investors coming up pretty soon about this exact question. I don't I don't know how to articulate it right now. It just depends on how it flows and works. But you as a savvy investor, you need to know how it works. That's why you're listening to the radio show and you need to know what's comfortable for you. Number 10 in the final. How do you handle maintenance requests? Now, this is critical. Now, this is why I'm going to end with this one. Oh, and I'll throw in another bonus question here in a minute. But how do you handle uh, maintenance requests? Now, our in, uh, me personally, we have a system. We use Buildium.com, and a tenant logs in or calls in, and we track it through um, a work order. We create a work order attached to that property, the date and time. It already stamps it. It's awesome. For legal purposes, it's incredible because if a tenant screams bloody murder, the slumlord never did this stuff. Well, ma'am, we created a work order on this day and this time. We called you on this day and this time, and you didn't answer your phone. We showed up on this time and this time. You didn't open the door. So blank, blank, blank. So that took three days, and then eventually we got to, you know, does that make sense? So, and you can keep tracking. Now, how does it work? Um, Do they charge you for a trip charge? Do they you know, like if, if a bloody tenant calls up and says, yeah, there's something wrong. My power box isn't working. You, is that property manager going to send an electrician over there or are they going to send a maintenance person first? And if so, who gets paid for that? Who charges that? And so, and then you got to find out what your normal process of handling that stuff. And do you send them a regular maintenance man? You need to kind of have this conversation. Are they writing them on sticky notes and shuffling papers or is it on their phone and an iPad? So find out how they're doing it and what happens um, when a, you know an upset tenant, how do they handle that? And you know here's some some hints for you. One, you should document everything. And hopefully they say that over and over again. We document everything, we save every text message. And this is how we calm tenants down and, and just open up dialect and find out how they handle it so you can understand when you're getting a bill for something. I always push it back on the tenant. We charge the tenant a trip charge. If we show up there and it's not legitimate, 
or they've, they've done the damage to the property that's not normal wear and tear, we do charge a tenant for that. Well, so here's the last bonus question. How, Mr. Property Manager, how do you handle lease renewals? Hmm. Do you automatically let it roll over a 30 day notice month to month? Or do you file, do you try to get the tenant to sign a lease extension? And if they do do a lease extension, how do you handle that? And just to give you that answer, it's a one page document. It's a lease addendum. It's addendum to the lease. And they just agreed upon. And then how do you handle increases? Do you uh, do an increase every month? I mean, every year. So all those things that you need to be aware of on the front end, and you should be increasing your rent somewhat. Are they going to call you or is an automatic thing or the rent increase is automatically in the lease already stated. Some leases stay uh, state that it automatically goes up three points every year. Anyway, Hopefully this was helpful information, man. We could spend days on this subject. This was part four. Hopefully it empowered you. Hopefully you feel strong and uh, that you are a bill, have ability and strength to go out and buy more assets. My name is Stephen Van Kallenberg. You tuned in to the Savvy Radio Show.com. We got other episodes. If there's something that you wanted to cover, let your boy know. Thanks for listening to the Savvy Radio Show. Glide online and listen to our other motivating episodes at SavvyRadioShow.com. Connect on Twitter at LandlordBook and always be buying assets.